are we done yet? I know it's difficult, but bear up with me because when you have your answers like ducks in a row, it's going to bode well for you in eternity and bode well for you in the temporal life. You may not get a good reaction, but they'll see that you're prepared. Point C, Acts 2, 32 to 33. See, I'm going through this verse by verse. Peter continued to address the crowd and declared, This Jesus God has raised up from which we are all witnesses. Peter, now at least we are all first century Jews. Are you one of these groups? No. So you can't have a whole church like the Church of Christ based on this one verse. You're not a witness actually of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and of those disciples, the 120 plus, that were speaking in tongues and evidencing being in, uh, baptized by the Holy Spirit. Peter declared that he was exalted at the right hand of God, the Father. And as promised by the Father, Jesus received the Holy Spirit, whom Peter declared Jesus had poured out the Spirit, and whose work you now see and hear in the disciples speaking in the tongues of the world of the marvelous works of God to all the Jews present from all over the world, especially of Jesus Christ and him crucified, resurrected, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. Were you there? Does this apply to you? Obviously not. Yet the whole denomination of the Church of Christ, this is their John 3.16. Nonsense. There's so much wrong with that idea, I don't even know where to begin. That's why we're beginning almost at the beginning, although it might take me several years to go through uh, the book of Acts and the book of Luke to present my case. In any case, <clears throat> this is what Peter said, Acts 2.32. See if what I summarized corroborates. Peter continued to address the crowd. <clears throat> this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promises of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now hear, see, and hear, in the sense of the pouring out into each individual disciple. Are you a disciple of Jesus of one of the 120 in the first century? The power to speak in known languages, to communicate the words of the Lord to them in their native languages. Were you there? Were you speaking in Phrygian or Egyptian? The marvelous works of God, especially of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the work of the Holy Spirit. So you're talking about Jesus, who you were a witness and who you observed, the believers, who are then to spoke, speak to non-believers all about Jesus Christ and Him crucified during the time when Jesus went to heaven. And during that time where the Bible wasn't even penned yet for the first uh, the, uh, the the Greek Bible, the New Testament, the first written material, so you could discern, discern it and then write it and disseminate it amongst all peoples of the world, just like we have the New Testament today, the 27 books of the New Testament written Greek. You don't have that yet. So how do you corroborate your testimony? By speaking in known languages to somebody, for example, do you know Italian? And he doesn't know English. So you're telling about Jesus and what John 3.16 says or whatever else you choose to convey. So Peter made a remarkable declaration to the crowd of Jews. Are you a crowd of Jews in order to bring home to them the message of the risen Christ in a personal way? Emphasizing that God was the one who raised up Jesus from the dead. This Jesus Christ, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Having corroborated the resurrection of Jesus with Scripture, Peter declared that he and the 120 disciples from the upper room who had accompanied him were eyewitnesses that God raised Jesus up from the dead. Remember, this was not written down yet. So how do you corroborate and, and then uh, your testimony? How do you authenticate it? By doing these miraculous things like speaking in Italian when you don't know Italian. Peter went on to say, <clears throat> Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, in the sense of exalting him to the supreme position of glory, power, and authority in the universe, evidently a declaration and demonstration of his victory over sin and death for all mankind. Is that not part of the gospel message? Yes. Whereupon Peter declared, <clears throat> And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, now in his exalted position of glory, power, and authority, poured out this, the Holy Spirit, 
which you now see and hear in the sense of the pouring out into each individual disciple, the Holy Spirit of the 120 some odd disciples. Are you one of them? No. Of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by the power to speak in known languages, to communicate the words of the Lord to them in their native languages. These were Jews from all over the world that didn't speak uh, the, the language of Hebrews or other Aramaic or other languages or Greek. They spoke other languages they wouldn't understand. Imagine having somebody talk to you. You from a foreign land come to Jerusalem and you want to know what's going on now. You're in the Holy Land and you're you're a Jew and you're honoring your uh, your your uh, responsibility. And all of a sudden somebody comes up to you and speaks in it in Phrygian or Egypt or Italian or whatever. And the disciples spoke to the crowd of the marvelous works of God, especially of Jesus Christ and him crucified as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. But how do you speak to the crowd unless you know all those different languages? Resurrected. Ascended to the right hand of the Father. That's what you want to tell. This is brand new stuff. Not written down yet. So how do you authenticate it? You speak in their language. You perform miraculous spiritual gifts, whatever God gave you to do. The outpouring of the Spirit was further evidence of Jesus' resurrection and exaltation to the right hand of the Father. For John the Baptist and Jesus after him had declared what? Jesus has promised to accomplish this outpouring of the Spirit. In Luke 3.16, 11, 11, 13, and Acts 1, 5, and 8. Note that the baptism, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples, was the promise of the Father, and the giver of the Spirit, Jesus, was the baptizer, the one who poured the Spirit forth, baptizing the disciples. This was a clear distinction of the persons of the Trinity. So, point D. And we're getting closer now. Do you have information? Are you confident that you can argue this? You need to learn this because people are so deceived by this. Whole denominate millions of people based their understanding of Acts 2.38 without looking at the first 37 verses of the book of Acts. Acts 2.34-37. Then Peter provided more evidence from Scripture by reading and interpreting Psalm 110. One, we just looked at a psalm before this. For David did not ascend into the heavens. Remember, he's still in the grave, his body. But he, he himself says, he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand <clears throat> until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter declared that it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but it was this Jesus whom they crucified who was both Lord, meaning God, and Christ, meaning their Messiah, Savior, and the Jews were pricked to the heart. They evidently recognized that Jesus was their Messiah, whom they had crucified. <clears throat> but there was no stipulation that all of them had repented, believed in him for forgiveness of sins. Now the word repent there, we're not talking about you're a sinner, we're talking about you didn't believe in Jesus. We're talking about you're a Jew in the first century. How do you repent from crucifying Christ? Can you uncrucify him? No, you repent by not believing, to moving from not believing to believing in him. Believed in him for forgiveness of sins. How do you get forgiven of sins unto eternal life? You believe. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What shall we do, men, brethren? Note that the word brethren referred to being fellow Jews, not fellow believers in Christ. Now that my my understanding of my uh, my teacher there he said no these are people who've already believed in Jesus but the problem is there was no indication that all believed in him they have somewhere uh, somewhat of an idea that they've done some wrong and they have to repent of that wrong what was the wrong doing they didn't believe now maybe they did but maybe somebody is saying what should we do not representative of all the people there okay and I've addressed this as we keep on reading <coughs> So, here are the verses again. Peter continued to say, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. See, that's the accusation. Not who, because of all the sins you're doing, but God has made this Jesus whom you crucified wrongly, both Lord and Christ in the sense of Messiah, Savior, penalty for the sins of the whole world you're paid by you behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world you crucified him so what are you going to do and having heard they were pricked to the heart convinced they have to do something because they did wrong but and what would they know what to do maybe maybe not they say also to Peter and to the rest of the apostles 
What shall we do then, men brethren, fellow Jews, right? Not fellow believers necessarily. Besides that, if Peter's asking, what should we all do? Is Peter's going to say, well, if those who believe, do you know how to believe? No, it doesn't say that. Stop reading into it. Whereupon Peter provided more evidence from Scripture of Christ's ascension to heaven, to, heaven, to the right hand of the, of the Father and his complete victory over sin and death and his enemies. For David, yeah, complete victory over sin and death and his enemies. Here it is. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he him, says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So David is not talking about himself. He's still in the grave. He's not resurrected yet. Psalm 110.1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Note that the first word in Psalm 110.1, rendered Lord, is, not, is from the Hebrew, Yahweh, meaning Lord. It especially refers to God the Father. This second word, rendered Lord, in the verse is from the Hebrew, Ladonai, or Adonai, also means Lord. It specifically refers to the Lord and Messiah, the Christ, who is God, God the Son, Jesus Christ, resurrected and glorified on the throne, sitting next to the right hand of the Father. David indicated in Psalm 110.1, and Peter indicated in Acts 2.34, quoting from this passage from Septuagint version, that it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Peter quoted David who said on this issue in Psalm 110.1, the Lord literally meaning the Lord, especially specifically referring to God the Father in this verse, said to my Lord, so God said to his son, the Lord God, Greek, kurio, mo, meaning to my Lord, same word, specifically referring to God the Son, the ascended Lord Jesus Christ, who was sitting at the right hand of the Father, the power and the place of authority and power, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, in the sense of a complete and total victory, it's not yet done. David was conveying that God the Father will put future tense, hence prophet, prophetic, the enemies, both earthly and heavenly, and his son under the subjugation of the son. Obviously, this not happened yet. Having presented his case so convincingly to the crowd of Jews in Jerusalem, for Jesus being the Christ, the Messiah, and corroborating it with Scripture, what is David's testimony in Psalm 116 and 110 in Acts 2, 25 to 31? The Apostle Paul concludes, Therefore let all the house of Israel notice once more that Peter was addressing Jews in the first century. We're not that. We're not that. So you church of Christ, you're not part of this audience. Know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you, you Jews crucified, both Lord, Curion, in the sense of being God, and Christ, Christ, meaning Greek, Christon, in the sense of the Messiah, God's anointed one from Israel, who was to rule over the eternal kingdom of God. These two titles refer to the deity and to the humanity, respectfully, of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, not David. The Greek verb, epoiosin, rendered has made, does not signify that God fabricated Jesus into being Lord and Christ at that moment in time. Rather, it is saying that Jesus was declared by God to be both Lord referring to his deity as the eternal Son of God and Christ in the sense of having fulfilled the requirement of his humanity of being an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, which declaration was evidenced by God's having raised him from the dead, ascended him into the glory at his right hand in the heaven. Notice that convincing and convicting fellow Jews in the sense of getting them to change their minds and believe that Jesus whom you crucified was both Lord and Christ unto forgiveness of sins and eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God was Peter's message. I don't want to repeat all of that. I can hardly breathe through that. Four, Peter was declaring the imminent fulfillment of the prophecy, Joel 2, 28 to 32. But it wasn't fulfilled yet. They started, but did all Israel believe? No, gone. Another generation, and another, and another, until 2021, still hasn't happened yet, but it will because God is faithful. In the sense of the commencement of the eternal kingdom of God, not yet here upon the earth, many people say it is because they misread these passages. So the commencement of the eternal kingdom of God has not been done yet. We've we got to go through the, the seven-year tribulation period. Where's the rapture? Not yet. So upon the earth shall all of that generation of Israel call upon the name of the Lord to be saved in the sense... In the sense of repenting from not trusting unto trusting. Repent means to change your mind, not necessarily a change of not sinning to sinning, but a change your mind about what? Now we had First Timothy was given advice in First Timothy from Paul about 
the way they rejected him so because he was such a young pastor and they didn't trust him what he had to say or take his message seriously. And uh, Paul admonishes um, the, that crowd and tells Timothy, be patient with them and maybe God will grant them repentance, not from sins, not from crucifying Christ, but for not respecting Pastor Timothy's 